to what promises to be um, a really fantastic talk um, uh, from Sinead uh, and Ollie uh, on their new book, uh, Getting to Zero. Um, they've, uh, they've just uh, just been finishing a, a tour of the East Coast, um, I was told. I, of course, thought that was the East Coast of, of Ireland, but apparently that's uh, been New York and Washington. Um, they've been doing uh, this small island uh, this week, and they'll be going off to Sierra Leone uh, in, in a few weeks' time. Um, so I'm just going to, to give a, a very short uh, introduction to both Sinead and, and, and Ollie, and, and then I'll let, you, uh, let them um, uh, present uh, their work in the book uh, for, for about 30 minutes, and then we'll go to questions. Um, so Dr Sinead Walsh uh, is currently the EU uh, ambassador to South Sudan. Um, she's got a week off work leave to come and uh, uh, promote the book. Uh, she's worked for Ireland's Department uh, of Foreign Affairs and Trade since 2009. Um, she was a senior fellow at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative in 2016, 2017. And prior to this, she served as the ambassador of Ireland uh, to Sierra Leone and Liberia and the head of Irish aid in, in both those two countries. And she was based in Freetown from 2011 to 2016. And it was during this time when Ebola struck uh, that Sinead uh, was there as the Irish ambassador and, uh, and head of Irish aid. And she threw herself uh, into efforts to raise alarm and rapidly scale up the response. She was coordinating and being a public face uh, around the world. Dr Oliver Johnson uh, is a visiting lecturer in global health at uh, King's College London. Uh, he was based in Freetown uh, from 2013 to 2015, working as the director of uh, King's College's uh, Sierra, Sierra Leone partnership. Um, he was awarded an, an OBE uh, in the 2015 Queen's Birthday Honours in recognition of his leadership role in the British response uh, to the Ebola outbreak. Um, Oliver and his team supported the management of more than 578 confirmed cases of Ebola in the Connaught Hospital, as well as the establishment of the Freetown Command Centre and Ebola isolation units at six government hospitals, which saw 2,571 suspected cases, of which 1,159 were positive. After Sierra Leone, Oliver has been a teaching fellow at King's Centre for uh, Global Health and Health Partnerships. Um, he helped uh, Lord Chris set up an, an all-party parliamentary group on global health, the UK par uh, Parliament. He now lives in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, where he's, um, he's been a strategic and technical advisor for African health placements um, and developed a range of different strategies uh, for health partnerships in Somaliland, Sierra Leone uh, and the Congo. Uh, so without further ado, um, I hand you over to Sinead and Oliver. Lovely to be here in Oxford um, to tell you a bit about our, our story, the story of our uh, quite accidental uh, uh, interaction with Ebola, because uh, uh, as uh, has been said, uh, both Oliver and I were in Sierra Leone for uh, entirely uh, different reasons and uh, uh, really did, uh, did not know what hit us uh, in, in the spring of, of 2014. Uh, I, I was, uh, um, you know, working uh, as head of the Irish Aid Program, the Irish Ambassador. We were mostly focusing on areas like nutrition, food security, uh, teenage pregnancy, women's rights, uh, these kinds of issues. Um, and Oliver, uh, uh, obviously, as, as the head of, of the small, this is the small Kings team, um, and focusing on sort of longer term uh, issues. Um, and I think one of the things that's maybe important to, to, to stress about uh, what happened uh, with the Ebola crisis is, of course, you know, no crisis is, happens within uh, a vacuum. And when, um, you know, when it was the sort of spring of, of 2014 and we started hearing that we had um, Ebola cases had been confirmed in, in the neighboring uh, country of Guinea, uh, we were dealing with a wide range of, uh, of very serious issues in, in, in Sierra Leone at the time. So just to sort of give you a, an illustration of this, I mean, this is a photo of one of the slums in, in Freetown, and 70% of the population of the city live in slums. So you can just try to imagine, 
you know, if we're starting to talk about health and, and, and infectious diseases and sanitation and hygiene and all these issues that are so relevant to Ebola, what an enormous challenge it is uh, actually, you know, if you are a, a resident of, of, of one of these slums and, and how, how, do you, how do you provide services and how do you, how do you keep yourself uh, safe. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was actually not, we weren't so much thinking about, about health issues in the spring of 2014. We were expecting a food security crisis in the rural areas because of what was happening with the harvests and the weather and the climate. Um, and so we were actually very focused on having, you know, meetings with government about this and how to mitigate this and, and looking at the nutritional situation and so on. Um, and again, you know, this is a country where there are crisis levels all the time of uh, child and, and, and maternal mortality. Uh, one in five children don't make it to the age of five. Only 10% of girls are, are going to end up finishing school. So we have a whole range of, of issues that we were dealing with, and, and we felt sort of very, very busy. Uh, I was also doing a lot of work on governance. Um, Sierra Leone had the, the dubious uh, uh, honor of, of uh, coming up as the the world's the, the country uh, with the highest bribery rates in the world just before the Ebola crisis uh, started. Uh, so we felt very busy, and when we started hearing uh, that there was Ebola in, in Guinea, um, in this area here where you see the red uh, circle is where there was the first case, which was actually a, an 18-month-old baby uh, called Emil Mwamwano, uh, who most likely was playing in a tree uh, close to his house uh, where there were the feces of bats. Uh, because bats used to used to hang around uh, in those trees in his village, most likely that was how how the first case uh, of Ebola in West Africa ever, uh, you know, uh, uh, happened. Um, and understandably, I suppose it took uh, quite a long time uh, for this mysterious illness that started killing Emil's uh, Emil himself, his mother. Uh, his, his sister, his aunt, and so on, and then you know uh, health workers and all sorts of people around his his community in rural Guinea. It took actually three months uh, for this to be diagnosed as Ebola, um, and this is so. It was in March of 2014 uh, when we started hearing about it in Sierra Leone, um, and again because we were so preoccupied with all of these other issues, um, I just my memory of that time was just sort of against, against hope, because when you look, at, uh, when you look at, at where this is, I mean, it's Guinea, but it's incredibly close to the border uh, with Sierra Leone. It's incredibly close to the border with Liberia. I mean, this is a border area which is a lot more meaningful, you know, when you look at a map than it is for the communities that live there, because it's mostly populated by uh, the Kisi ethnic group that, you know, for centuries well before we put names on these countries were, were just going back and forth amongst themselves. And so uh, really, uh, it, 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 geographically, uh, uh, it wasn't very likely that we would dodge that bullet in Sierra Leone, but, but nevertheless, uh, this, was, this was our hope. And uh, Oliver will tell you what happened next. Thanks, Sinead. So uh, as Sinead already said, I was uh, working in the main government hospital for King's College London. So it was a university team. And we weren't supposed to be doing, well, certainly not humanitarian work, but not even clinical work. So our work there was to support the medical school and the, the hospital to do long-term strengthening of systems, uh, medical curriculum development, and so on. Small team, very little budget. Um, but we were a partnership, so we were there to support the hospital. And when uh, the first cases of Ebola were confirmed, the Minister of Health set up a task force. Uh, she got together United Nations agencies, NGOs, ministry officials to start planning. And she called us up and asked us uh, to support because by good chance we'd had an infectious disease specialist from Spain join my team on the week that the Ebola outbreak started. So we were really lucky about that. Um, and so we started planning the response. Um, but right from the beginning, uh, we got things wrong. So we had a window in Sierra Leone of about two months between the first case diagnosed in Guinea and the first case being diagnosed as crossing the border to Sierra Leone. So we were lucky because we had a little bit of a warning. Um, but in that time, it was mostly a paper exercise. So I was asked to help uh, develop some hospital guidelines. How should a hospital prepare for a possible Ebola case walking through its doors? And, and we downloaded the, the WHO guidelines and we adapted them. But but even though we were working outside of, inside of the office of the, the national director of hospitals, he couldn't give us a list of hospitals in the country. Uh, eventually, we were able to compile one. 
You got email addresses for the medical superintendents, but almost none of them had access to internet. And those that did probably didn't have a working printer. So the reality of even these hospitals getting a printed set of guidelines in those first few months was low. Uh, the training they got, one, one junior doctor, one nurse from each hospital went uh, and got basically a PowerPoint uh, training on how to deal with Ebola, uh, and then was sent off and told to train everybody else in the hospital. And on paper, the minister was able to say that all the hospitals were prepared, everyone had been in trained, but of course, in reality, nothing was there to prepare people. So then when Ebola came across the border, it very rapidly spread. And because health workers were in direct contact with, with very sick patients, a huge number of doctors and nurses in the early days became infected. Um, patients and health workers started to avoid health facilities, and there was a real rapidly a collapse of the health system. And this is the, the small room in the emergency department at Connaught Hospital, uh, where Kings had supported the, the, the hospital to set up two uh, beds for possible Ebola cases. And one of the real mistakes we made was that there was this um, kind of uh, wisdom, the established wisdom, was that Ebola didn't cause major urban outbreaks. People thought it was a thing for rural villages, it would be a small outbreak, and so we thought maybe we'll see one or two cases, someone will get on a bus from a rural area, they'll come into the city and they'll come here. Uh, so we had two beds, but pretty quickly those two beds were occupied, and then I remember getting a phone call from the emergency department nurse saying, we've actually got a, a third case, where do we put them? Uh, and it was at that point that we realized that we'd really underestimated what was coming towards us, and so that night, um, the medical superintendent of the hospital shut down half of the emergency department. Um, and you can see some of my team here working with the maintenance team, the cleaners, everyone else, to convert this ward in the matter of about two, three hours, buying fans, putting up plastic sheeting, buying buckets for a very rudimentary uh, Ebola unit. And again, we thought, gosh, well, maybe, we'll, maybe worst case scenario, we'll see 20 patients. Wouldn't that be overwhelming? In fact, we saw more than 1,000 patients in this room, of which more than 750 tested Ebola positive. And that's nearly twice the number in total of the largest ever previous Ebola outbreak. So what we were experiencing was of a different order of magnitude than we'd ever seen with Ebola outbreaks before. And at about that time, and this was about August 2014, uh, the, 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 the panic started to set in. We began to see a small number of international, uh, international health workers get infected, and so suddenly Ebola made the front pages. Uh, airlines like British Airways uh, cancelled flights, um, uh, in a, uh, and that sort, sort of um, caused a cascade, a domino effect of NGOs, international agencies pulling out, evacuating from the countries, flights cancelling. Um, and, and so suddenly we found ourselves very isolated in the country. Uh, we were completely overwhelmed uh, in this facility. Uh, we couldn't take more patients than we had beds because we wouldn't be able to keep the staff safe. And so we had more and more patients collapsing at the front gates of the hospital just outside that window uh, on the hot tarmac with nowhere for them to go. Uh, and so we, we had a sort of shed. Uh, we built a shed to shade people, but we couldn't admit them into the hospital. Um, and so uh, we, you know, we started uh, trying to prepare uh, for a larger number of cases, but it was so difficult because the response virtually didn't exist. Uh, and this um, is, is a slide of the Freetown Command Center, which we supported to set up. So at about that time, I went up to the, the military hospital, and they'd set up a really nice small Ebola unit there. But to my surprise, it was half empty, even though we had patients dying outside of our unit. And I realized there just was no coordination going on. So there was no coordination. Where were their beds? Where were their ambulances? Where were things needed? So we worked with the district health management team, and it was really a question of, uh, buying a couple of whiteboards, getting some flip chart paper, and just trying to make sense of the response. Um, uh, and it was an extraordinary who stepped up. So this is uh, Amar. Amar uh, was, in many ways, the perfect person to be coordinating ambulances. Her background had been stage managing Wicked the Musical uh, in London. Um, and she'd come out to Sierra Leone to work as a teacher in primary schools, as a volunteer. And when Ebola, Ebola crisis hit, she said, what can I do to help? But of course, she was much better suited than, than a doctor to try and co coordinate things. Um, and so we saw a lot of people who you wouldn't expect stepping up. But really, you would have thought the World Health Organization should have been doing this. You would have thought that the other major players should have been doing this. But the reality was there was virtually nothing. And you can't quite see the bottom whiteboard. But on that bottom whiteboard was a list of names of people who we believed probably had Ebola, but we didn't have a bed for them. So they were quarantined in their homes. Sometimes their home was really just a one-room kind of shack with no running water, no toilet. But they would be quarantined with their entire extended household and family, which meant you might have one person quarantined with a, do a dozen family members who were sick, vomiting, infectious. We didn't have a bed for them because, as you can see, the available beds, zero, zero, zero. And the treatment centers, full, full, full. So 
uh, day after day, and this is the 29th of September this photo was taken, so this was four months into the Sierra Leone outbreak, six months into the overall outbreak, and still this is all we had in terms of a response. Uh, and so it really felt like Armageddon, and at about this time, the US Center for Disease Control developed a new model of how they thought the outbreak might unfold. And they said if the uh, response didn't improve, there might be 1.4 million infections in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and that's one in 10 of the population. So, you know, we had no idea how bad this was going to get. Uh, and there were cases in Nigeria, uh, and so we didn't know how far it was going to spread across the continent and across the world. Uh, and I, I remember driving home and just imagining what would it look like as I drove through the city for one in 10 people to be infected with Ebola. What happens to your police force and to your army and your civil service when so many people are getting sick Everyone starts to stay home. How does the government continue to function? So we really were facing a kind of end of the world situation at this moment and waiting for a response to arrive. So I'll hand back to Sinead at this point to, to pick up the story. Yeah, so it was, um, it was very surreal those days in, um, in Freetown um, because, you know, as Oliver said, there, there was no... There was no precedent for any of this, um, and so even you know when we you know we would get the few experts that were passing through, you know they would sort of say, look, you know I've seen Ebola, but I'm, I've never seen this, and you know sort of you know your guess is as good as mine to some extent, and so you know my role uh, w was predominantly kind of trying to to you know raise the alarm and 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 sort of going around the country talking to to people like Oliver and trying to get kind of um, you know media attention, trying to have you know. Uh, con you know, conference calls with uh, WHO in Geneva and the UN in New York and anybody you know who might listen um, to try and, and, and sort of say uh, you know like when is when is the cavalry arriving? You know, I mean, we, we, this is this is just uh, uh, as Oliver said, it, it felt like Armageddon, um, and it was unbelievably difficult to to make any progress to have any traction with this, which we just found so incredibly puzzling because. I think, and, and Oliver and I talked about this much later, you know, we, we kept sort of saying, I mean, the cavalry will arrive, right? I mean, there are people in this world who know how to, you know, deal with these kind of situations, who have the experience, who have the resources. And, I mean, we're just sort of, you know, punters, uh, you know, kind of trying to, to um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, stick the, the, the finger in the dam and we're about to be completely overwhelmed. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, and, you know, where, where are those people um, and why aren't they coming? And, and really, we were having this conversation um, for the first six months of, of the declared outbreak. So really, you know, from, from, uh, May, from March when we knew it was Ebola in Guinea until September, it really did feel uh, like the world uh, was asleep. Um, and, uh, and we couldn't really understand uh, why. Now, eventually, this did, um, this did change. The, 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 you know, I, I think from September onwards, we felt, uh, we felt like you know, the world did wake up. It did seem to have a lot of uh, relationship with things like uh, the American physician, Kent Bratney, getting infected in Liberia, things like the Liberian man going to Nigeria, which, of course, has a lot more linkages to the Western world. And, you know, we did actually see a, a very direct relationship between, you know, the Western world potentially being infected and uh, affected um, and uh, an action on the ground, but at the same time, we were, we were going to take it. <laughs> we weren't going to turn it down. And, and uh, uh, you'll probably recognize the woman in the middle there, Samantha Power. And she and Barack Obama, I think, played a very important role uh, in September um, in, in like literally just calling world leader after world leader after world leader to say, OK, Korea, what can you do? What can you send? Do you have any health workers? You, you know, can, you, can you send any protective equipment and so on? Um, and we did start to see a huge uh, uh, influx, I would say. We kind of got the announcements in September and then kind of October, November, December, we actually started to see, you know, a whole fleet of ambulances would arrive, uh, thousands of protective equipment uh, would arrive, there'd be, you know, 400 uh, NHS workers and this kind of thing. And so it, it was this huge, uh, ultimately, international um, response. But I think one of the things that, that we learned was that actually the whole notion that this was a sort of a cavalry who would just kind of come in and take care of things was actually uh, a mirage. Uh, it was completely unrealistic because even when all of these resources arrived, it took an incredibly long time to, to get to zero. We actually had Ebola 
for 21 and a half months, which is little known fact, because when I say this to people at home and so on, they say, but I mean, it was just in the media for a couple of months, and then we didn't see it in the media, so we thought, you know, it's obviously been sorted out. So, but it actually took almost two years, because um, all of those resources, when they finally arrived, had to somehow function in the very specific local context, right? So they had to function within, uh, uh, you know, the complexities of, you know, communities in remote areas that don't trust outsiders, that don't trust the government, that have, you know, that felt very uh, neglected, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that somehow we had to, we had to sort of figure that out. Um, there was a huge amount of politics uh, going on. Um, there were all sorts of challenges, and, and much as we had lots of, ultimately, hundreds of, of experts and epidemiologists and CDC and WHO and so on, um, that it still took a lot of time for the response to really actually work. And so I suppose Oliver and I found ourselves in the situation of, you know, your, your role changed. I mean, my role certainly changed from, you know, sort of raising the alarm to actually then trying to say, okay, you know, I've been in this country for a few years. I can maybe help you to, to sort of how to navigate this particular ministry or, you know, this, this particular, um, you know, kind of coordination problem because, uh, you know, of course, all of this uh, was just needed to be so incredibly context uh, specific. Um, so we eventually uh, got to zero uh, after all of those uh, months. And there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of sort of jubilation, which in a way, you know, we, we obviously we understood uh, and we felt to some extent. But I think, you know, for, for people like Oliver and I who'd been in the uh, country before the crisis started, we found it actually quite uncomfortable and uneasy when all these celebrations were happening because we had seen, you know, the whole trajectory and we had seen those first six months and all the mistakes that had been made and all the delays and all the neglect. And we knew that thousands of lives, the vast majority of lives, had been lost unnecessarily. An Ebola outbreak, it may, it may be inevitable that you lose a very small number of lives when Ebola breaks out because you have to get yourself organized and so on and so forth. There is no excuse for thousands of people dying um, of, of this disease. Um, and so, you know, 3,956 uh, Sierra Leoneans died on paper. Uh, we all know that that's a, a vast understatement because in the early days in that red circle in particular, there were a lot of deaths that were undocumented. But the other issue was there was a lot of people who died of Ebola, who died because of Ebola, but not of Ebola. So there were people who would have been receiving uh, HIV treatment or TB treatment that they could no longer get because Ebola meant the health system shut down. There were women who went to, you know, try to give birth and couldn't find a, a medical worker because of Ebola. So there was a lot of what we call the secondary impacts. And one of our big mistakes in the response uh, is, an, and something that I personally uh, feel as though I should have put a huge amount more emphasis on, uh, is actually those, those secondary impacts. Um, so this was really where the idea of the book, although it wasn't an, the idea wasn't a book initially, we just thought we'd write something down, uh, Oliver and I, and it was again accidental because we ran into each other accidentally, and we ended up having this conversation about how, how uncomfortable we were with the, the back slapping and you know, the celebrations, and how we thought that you know, you know, people should know, the world should know the real story of what happened, and we should speak frankly about mistakes, including our own uh, mistakes, but also so many amazing things did happen, and so many Sierra Leoneans in particular uh, made huge sacrifices to help the country to get out of this, and some of them are not alive to tell that story, and some of them you know, were, were, were colleagues and, and, and friends, um, and so we wanted to tell some of those uh, stories as well, um, and you know, sort of, you know, hopefully make a small uh, contribution to you know this kind of thing not uh, not happening again, so we we kind of did a, a big uh, um, you know sort of um, you know we kind of read you know what what everybody else was saying. There's been a lot of reviews of what happened during the Ebola crisis, um, and we interviewed about 85 people. So you know from from Ebola survivors at village level to uh, to the president of Sierra Leone, to Secretary General of the UN, and and all sorts of people in between to try and also challenge uh, some of our own beliefs and perceptions. Because of course, when we were working, you know, we had our own 
uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, perspective and our own, uh, um, you know, our own uh, vision, which wasn't necessarily, you know, taking into account some of the constraints. So some of the people that we might have been very angry with, it was useful to actually interview them and almost all the time, not all the time, but almost all the time, you'd learn something about maybe what they were facing that led them to behave in that way that you found so infuriating. So it was quite a good, a good painful, but quite a good process. Um, but really, th really, this is, this is our, our stories sort of informed by that, but this is our sort of stories of, of, of what we, what we uh, respectively um, uh, kind of experienced during that time. Um, so just to finish up, we, we have sort of five big lessons uh, of the book. Um, and they're not, you know, the first one is, is very much the most important uh, for us, uh, which is this whole area of community engagement. This was by far the biggest mistake uh, of the response. Um, and uh, I think, you know, you can sort of see in the photograph you know, some of what we did wrong, you know, sort of going around with posters and loudspeakers, it was very much a model of instructing people, you know, of sort of, you know, rational facts. And if you think about how health promotion works in, you know, in our own countries, if I think about how health promotion works in Ireland, uh, this is not what works, actually. Uh, uh, you know, to a large extent, we need to, to look, to, to, to talk to people where they are, to listen to them, to listen to their constraints, you know, rather than just sort of saying you should do you should do A, B, C, um, and we know this. I mean, this, these are the fundamentals of of uh, behavior change. But somehow, for far too long in this Ebola response, uh, we operated in this instructive way. Um, and also, as as Oliver has mentioned, we took a very punitive approach. Actually, so I mean, this is actually um, this is a soldier um, in in Liberia, and at one point in Liberia, they took a very similar approach to Sierra Leone, and they locked up a whole slum of 250,000 people uh, called West Point in Monrovia, um, you know, basically to sort of cordon them off, to kind of build a wall between them and everybody else. And it was a complete disaster. And, and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, to her credit, she recognized this and she ended this policy uh, and she said, okay, I now understand that we need to be engaging with communities in a supportive way, in a collaborative way, in a partnership and not in, in this very punitive way. Unfortunately, in Sierra Leone, despite uh, uh, some of our efforts, um, the, the, the government of Sierra Leone stuck with the punitive approach. They stuck with the quarantine. Um, so just try to imagine, you know, if you know, one of your family members is taken off to this, you know, treatment center that, you know, nobody ever seems to come back from. And then you and everybody else in your household is locked up for 21 days with other people that are suspected to be infected. It doesn't exactly say to you, my government cares about me, those internationals, they care about me. And so this was really, I think, the, the, the biggest issue. And, and when we interviewed Tom Frieden, who is the head of CDC at the time in the U.S., uh, about his view on, on the sort of the epidemics in the three countries, he said, in Sierra Leone, that quarantine policy added six months to your response. And we 100% we agreed with him. Um, and, and, you know, the last point on that is really about, about empathy and about trust. And, and, you know, we mentioned the secondary impacts. Uh, you know, we, we were very good at, at, at a certain point. We became very good at treating Ebola. But if you came with your child and your child had diarrhea or malaria, then we would send you home, right? Because we were interested in Ebola. And of course, you know, if you're a mother and you have a child, you don't really care what the child has. You want the child to be taken care of. And why would you, again, trust somebody who, who's not interested unless you have this, this specific disease? So these were the ways in which we failed to, to show empathy. We failed to help people to uh, strategize themselves and to come you know, to, 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 to overcome their own constraints, uh, you know, and support them to overcome their constraints to defeat this disease. Um, I will say towards the very end of the response, we finally, and thanks to some very strong Sierra Leonean leadership, we finally got a lot better at this. And so we, we do uh, give some uh, examples of, of what happened uh, that was better in the book. Like, for example, um, you know, we started doing things like you know, getting community leaders. And people were very afraid of ambulances. Um, and understandably, you know, a lot of people who went into ambulances never came back. Uh, so there was this fear. And so, uh, but of course, you know, it also, you know, it was also important that, that ambulances be used. So at one point, we got sort of community leaders to, 
you know, to sort of get into ambulances in front of everybody in the community and sort of show, look, you know, there's nothing here. It's, it's you know, it's fine. I'm in, you know, these kinds of things that were then making people feel as though they understood a little bit better what was going on and doing tours of treatment centers before they opened and trying to let people visit uh, treatment centers, you know, so they didn't think their, their relatives had just kind of gone into some sort of a black hole. So some of these uh, um, techniques, I think, towards the end of the response were, were very effective and, and you know, we hope uh, we, we're in touch sometimes with people working in Congo at the moment, <coughs> you know, who are trying to use some of those uh, kinds of techniques. Um, the second big lesson then is around leadership and coordination. Um, you know, we mentioned this is Barack Obama hugging uh, Nina Pham, the, the Ebola survivor from, from Texas, the nurse, um, and, and President Karoma, uh, you know, with, with, with some local chiefs. Um, so leadership and coordination, as I think we mentioned, both from WHO and from the government, was initially incredibly weak, and, and this was very, uh, very significant coordination, as Oliver has shown with the whiteboard, was very weak. But eventually this did improve, and we have to give credit, the British government played a huge role when they came in to take a leadership role, and, and the US, uh, respectively, in Liberia. They really played a very important role in, in getting to zero, and I think it's, it's important to, to recognize that. We, we do criticize them in the book for some things, but we do say that, that they were absolutely central, uh, and they really did provide, provide leadership. Um, and then the third, a third lesson is about politics and accountability. You know, issues around corruption, issues around power plays and so on, both with, with international organizations and within the government. Um, you know, really, and even at community level, these were the biggest issue that we all had on a day-to-day -day basis. Not any kind of technical, complex, <laughs> Ebola-related issues, and eventually not resources, but actually, uh, you know, how some people in various organizations were trying to use those resources for, for personal uh, gain uh, was what absolutely plagued, uh, plagued us. And so I think we find that that this lesson is really important to talk frankly about because a lot of the reviews of the Ebola response don't mention this and we think maybe there's a good bit of political correctness about you know you don't talk about certain things but actually uh, this was this was very much a huge a huge obstacle and so we, we we're trying to sort of speak quite quite frankly about that uh, again to see to see what can be learned for the future. And, you know, this is actually some of the points where Sinead and I interacted because we didn't work closely together, but on, on the front line clinically, day after day, my problems were political. So, for example, at that point where we had bodies outside of Connaught, uh, some local uh, government hospitals came to us and said, look, could you help us to set up Ebola units and DFID offers to fund us? And we had enough staff. We said, yes, sure. But it would get blocked somewhere in the political hierarchy. This would get blocked even at a time where the crisis was so bad because it affected someone's power within the government, because an international agency wanted to take the credit for it rather than us. So these kind of manoeuvrings were the things that actually on a day-to-day uh, basis or what I was uh, blocked up against and, and stuck with and, and often I would go to Sinead or the British American ambassador and say you've got to help me out here I don't know, I don't know what to do anymore because I'm stuck at the politics and, and that was a real shock to me a surprise it's one thing to have the challenge out there as Ebola and it's a, it's a, it's a challenge you understand and conceptualize but actually when it's all around you with the politics it's quite overwhelming so another one, and it's you know, um, partly linked to politics, is the idea of working through government systems. So there's a bit of a tradition in the humanitarian sector to uh, go it alone. So a lot of organizations, humanitarian organizations, um, which they want to set up a clinic, will go open up some tents, bring their own staff, and so on. And, and historically, this is sometimes for good reason. So in an armed conflict, the government might actually be one of the parties of the conflict. So it's necessary for humanitarian actors to be totally independent of them and not work directly with government. But that was not the case here. We were not in, a, in an armed conflict. This was a situation of an infectious disease outbreak where the Sierra Leone government was the best place organization, the one with the democratic legitimacy to lead the response. And yet, so many humanitarian actors followed that same approach. And this was uh, Kerrytown. Kerrytown was the so-called crown jewel of the British response. It was uh, built by the British military, the Royal Engineers. Uh, it was operated by Save the Children, funded by DFID, uh, and uh, as you can see, the first moment where the British government agreed to build this was on the 12th of August, but it didn't actually see a single patient until the 5th of November. And even when it opened, it opened very, very slowly. So at this moment of absolute crisis, we were spending months and months. And why did it take so long? Well, a lot of the reasons were 
to do with coordination and politics, but a lot of them were to do with the fact of building a, a new hospital out of the bush. You can see you have to clear the bush, put in concrete floors, put in sanitation where it didn't exist, electricity, security, create a new leadership structure, a new supply chain, took months at a time where every single day this outbreak was getting further and further away from us. So what we were doing at King's um, was we were working with local his, uh, hospitals. This was a, a small hospital in the middle of Freetown called Macaulay Street. At the back, they had this yard area. So we took an MSF tent. Uh, we built some extensions to it. The first conversation I had with the medical superintendent about the idea of this uh, clinic was on the 24th of October. It was on a Sunday. But by the 31st of October, we were able to have patients admitted to this fully constructed. And the way we were able to do that is we used the existing hospital staff, their leadership structure, their supply chain, and we just supported them to adapt that. So one of the really important lessons is that if you need to move quickly, working with government should be your first priority. Now, there was a lot of politics in partnership. It wasn't easy. Um, but I think too often our first resort is to go it alone. Uh, also in terms of price, uh, this cost us about $5,000 to build. The, the cost of construction operating in Kerrytown was 80 million pounds. So it's an incredibly expensive uh, route to go as well. Uh, and Tulip Mazumda, the BBC Global Health correspondent, went back to Kerrytown a year after the end of the outbreak to see what had happened to it. And she reported that she found it occupied only by goats. So you can see that, that the legacy you leave by creating tents in the bush it evaporates to nothing. With Kings, we were able, whilst we were doing this, to build a permanent infectious disease center at the hospital. Uh, a permanent building <laughs> that can operate for any infectious disease, cholera, TB, anything, for future outbreaks. And it's now a training site for future doctors in infectious diseases. So it is possible in a crisis to build government health systems. But it also speaks to a broader point which is that since the end of the civil war in Sierra Leone, there had been a huge effort from the government of Sierra Leone and the international community to rebuild and build a stronger health system. And yet, as Ebola entered the country, you saw the health system collapse like a house of cards because health workers hadn't been paid for months. They'd been poorly trained. There was no running water in, in the wards. There was no supply of soap and gloves. The very basics of the health system didn't exist. So the efforts we had been making to strengthen that health system, millions of pounds spent, had not been uh, translating into an effective health system. Uh, and yet, uh, we haven't learned the lessons from that. So we, what we should have done, in my view, when we ended the outbreak, was to redouble our efforts, partly on the governance side of building trust, but partly on this idea of strengthening essential health services. Instead, what we've done is we've gone through a route of, of something called global health security, which is a very colonial mindset of saying, how do we protect ourselves from Africa? How do we in Britain protect ourselves from outbreaks? So it's a focus on um, uh, vaccines and technologies and, uh, and in, in, in disease control, when what we really need is a, a functioning basic health system. And our final lesson was the importance of individuals. And, and there were some individuals in the response who just played a critical role, regardless of their organization, in shaping how that played out. And there were certain features of how they uh, of how they work that stood out to us. So we talk about them in the book. And the one I really want to focus on here is Yvonne Aki Sawyer. So Yvonne was a, a Sierra Leonean businesswoman. She was working in London at the time of the response, but she was determined to contribute. So she got on a plane. She presented herself to the National Ebola Response Center and said, look, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm a businesswoman, but I, I think I can contribute. And she became the national director of policy for the response. Um, and she played a critical role in strengthening the Sierra Leonean leadership of the response and the things that Sinead talked about in terms of really bringing engagement to communities. Uh, that was something that critically she was able to contribute to. Uh, and earlier last year, she was elected mayor of Freetown. And she's doing an extraordinary job now at not only doing things like improving sanitation and water and so on, uh, but also at looking at this issue of governance and accountability, tax collection, the basic things you need for the city to run. Um, uh, and we were kind of delighted that she's a fan of the book. So we're going to uh, Sierra Leone uh, in about a month's time uh, to have this conversation, because I think a lot of this conversation is about uh, domestically uh, the governance. Not only was Yvonne elected last year, but there was also a change in government. The opposition won the election. Uh, and some people think that the corruption in the Ebola response was one of the reasons why the former party got kicked out. So there's a lot of interesting governance questions around that. Um, but there were also a lot of people in the international community. And um, I'm not just saying that because he's the chair of this event, but Nick's partner, Ali, which is how we know each other, she was in Sierra Leone as a governance advisor uh, during the response and was someone who uh, was able to help us set up that Freetown Command Center. 
help us to set up the uh, 117 emergency call line, a whole number of things. Uh, and her team of governance advisors were an actual absolutely critical part. And at the beginning, I, thought, I think they thought, as governance advisors based in the Ministry of Energy or the Ministry of Finance, what role would we have in an Ebola response? But the truth was, people who could navigate the politics and get organized were people who could be transformative. So um, they were a really good example of that. So on this point, we want to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you really open this up to uh, discussion and debate. Thank you very much. So the, the final message I took from that is come, come to a school of governance and, and specialise in governance, and you too can help solve Ebola. Um, so let's take questions. Lucy, I think we've got a mic. Yep, you, there were gentlemen at the back. Let's first off. Just pla if you could say your name first. Thank you. Uh, Tom Clark. Uh, you'll have to uh, excuse me. Um, I missed the first uh, five minutes or so of your talk. So I would be very grateful if you would um, itemize what you would like to be in place in terms of the health system in, in the countries you've referred to that w are necessary to prevent or uh, limit any further outbreaks. And pardon my ignorance, but would you explain how sort of personal behavior, maybe eating practices or personal hygiene, contribute towards the, the appearance of, of this or similar pathogens? And finally, if I may, uh, this is not a very uh, politically correct thing to say, but one of the uh, criticisms about um, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa certainly, is that it's possible to provide infrastructure, in, 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 in your case, a health system left in place. But as in the case of, of Carytown, once it's, prov once it's provided, it's not maintained because the people don't have the inherent... <laughs> Um, temperament to maintain any form of infrastructure. Thank you. Do you want to answer that one, or, or do you want to collect some questions? Wait, Why do you answer that one? Yeah, I want to answer the first part, which I think is the easier part. I'll leave Sinead to the second half. So I think in terms of uh, health systems, I would just say that there's two sides to that. So one side of a health system is the technical side, and there's a lot of WHO uh, kind of guidance on the different components of a health system, which range from having the right physical infrastructure, the right supply chains of materials, but more importantly, a kind of motivated, trained health workforce um, and really good leadership and governance. But too often, when it comes to international programs, so the programs of the Global Fund or in the American government's PEPFAR around HIV and AIDS, people like to, to start with the, the kind of photo op, so uh, the vaccine being you know, given to the child or the woman in labor. Um, and, and a lot of that is, is what's sort of called the Daily Mail effect. There's such pressure. There's such skepticism, inherent skepticism about aid uh, versus, you know, we don't care about other parts of government spending. No one, crit no one looks at what MOD does with its money. DFID is the only government department that has three auditors. And there's such a huge pressure to demonstrate how every penny of British aid money is spent that there, there's a pressure to, uh, and to demonstrate how every penny directly impacts somebody's life. We tend to only focus on the very downstream things, the last moment of healthcare contact at the particular clinic level. And so we neglect the core of the health system. You know, the focus is not on the medical school or having good training of medical nursing pharmacy students. It's not on the warehouse of drugs and a good supply chain. And so what we tend to do, and I think this is our fault because this is the pressure we put on government for how they spend the money, is just to focus and then try and kind of retroactively re-engineer a health system from the outside in. So that's one side, but I think there's another side to a health system that's very important, and that's a relationship between the health system and, and communities. And I think too often uh, there's an inherent mistrust, uh, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that when health workers haven't been paid for a year, of course they're going to ask for money from their patients each day, even when they're not supposed to, and that's called a bribe. But the reality is that that nurse has not been paid for a year. And so, of course, into that it grows an increasing mistrust uh, and so building a, not only trust but also accountability. So to what extent do our political processes mean that when there are problems in the health system, when drugs are being stolen, when health workers aren't showing up to work, uh, to what extent is there an accountability process within the government whereby people can change their leaders and hold them to account? And I think that accountability process in a, is in a health system is as important as the more technical bit that I focus on around what are the right drugs and are they getting to the right places. So, so that would be kind of my comment on, on that. But, but Sinead, do you want to pick up on anything else there? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the you know, the question of, um, you know, behaviors and, and linkages to the Ebola um, epidemic, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure about behaviors. I think there were some cultural uh, practices, particularly around burials, that made, uh, you know, communities in West Africa more vulnerable than, you know, places where uh, burials are done in a different way. So a lot of communities, um, you know, had a, a practice in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea of, of washing bodies and a lot of people being involved in washing bodies before uh, burial as, 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 as part of a ritual. Now, uh, 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 somebody who dies of Ebola, they're, they're actually at their most infectious uh, at that time for the first 48 hours after death. So washing bodies is obviously incredibly um, dangerous. Um, and this was one of the areas that, again, we, you know, we failed to address, I think, for, for a very long time in a, in a proper way. So we basically sort of came in and said, so for now, we're just going to pause that, uh, you know, your normal way of, of burying people, and we're going to bury people in these bags. And we're just going to take the body away and put it in this bag, and you know, and you sort of, we were kind of saying this as though, well, you know, and obviously this is very logical, you know, in our, uh, you know, kind of medical training, and therefore you will sort of accept it. And it was understandably uh, a disaster. Um, and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, what we, we completely failed to take into account was that within, you know, people's uh, spiritual and religious practices, you know, for them, you know, you know, this could mean all sorts of things. This could mean that the soul of this person would never rest. This could mean that the soul of this person would, would haunt the rest of the community for not giving them a proper burial. Uh, so we, we just, we, we weren't, because we weren't listening, right? <laughs> we weren't hearing those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I mean, some of the people, uh, you know, that, that, you know, have, have talked about this, you know, uh, at the village level that we've spoken to, they say, you know, I mean, it was like our, 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 uh, our, you know, our family members were being thrown away like rubbish. In these, in these plastic bags, you know? And so eventually uh, the response came to a kind of a, a compromise, you know, again, one of these sort of better practices that we, we took far too long to, to do, but we eventually improved on um, in that, you know, yes, you still needed to have this sort of sanitized burial, but, you know, you were able to do this, you know, some, some of these rituals kind of you know, from a, uh, from a distance. So you were able to have family members attend burials, but they had to stand, you know, 10 feet away. You were able to have an imam, you know, say prayers and all that, you know. So there were, there were ways it wasn't by any means perfect, but at the same time, you know, all of these communities have ways in which they've coped with previous crises before. So a lot of it was about saying, okay, let's have a conversation you know, what can we do, what can you do, how can we support you to make this a less uh, painful process, bearing in mind that, you know, we have certain things that, that, you know, just have to happen to protect you and your family from infection. So, so that, you know, is, is precisely the sort of compromising um, that, that, yeah, that we eventually, you know, uh, and I think that there was a quote up there, I think, from Paul Richards, you know, villagers started thinking like epidemiologists and epidemiologists started thinking like villagers. That was that sort of merging that eventually I think was, was fruitful. I mean, in terms of uh, your last question about, you know, maintenance and, and this being related to temperament, I have, no, uh, I have no evidence that this is the case. I mean, I've been working in Africa for most of the last 20 years. What I do know is the case is that a lot of uh, organizations, uh, both international organizations and governments, don't budget for maintenance in the way that they should. So Oliver knows this was a huge <laughs> bugbear of mine that we had all these uh, ambulances coming in and burial vehicles, you know, coming in for the Ebola response. Um, and, you know, if you go to, to your average uh, hospital um, car park anywhere in Sierra Leone, you will find a whole load of cars that haven't moved in years because there was all this, you know, energy about the project and the vehicle, and nobody was really uh, uh, taking into account the maintenance. So I think that's that's a that's a fault of all of ours, and it relates to the same thing about, you know, it's the boring stuff, you know, like Oliver is saying, you know, nobody wants to look at, you know, fixing the national drug supply system, you know, everybody wants to to, to look at the. Uh, 
you know, the sort of, the, 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 you know, the woman, you know, the baby and, you know, the, the, the sort of stuff that we, that, that's very tangible. Um, and so I think it's the same with, with maintenance that it's sort of, it's not glamorous, uh, you know, it's kind of dull and, uh, you know, and we like to kind of put it aside, but I, I'm not sure that's an especially African thing. Uh, I think uh, those of us who work for international organizations, we, we need to take responsibility if we're providing resources, you know, whether they're boreholes and you, you go around all sorts of places, you'll find a lot of boreholes that haven't been maintained as well. Uh, you know, I think, I think we all need to take responsibility for that. I just, you know, from my experience at the hospital, every day we used to get different members of the hospital knocking on my door, asking to collaborate with us in a different day, and by far the most persistent group was the group from the maintenance department, who were the guys that were there at 10.30 at night helping. The doctors, one doctor was there at 10.30 night, most of the doctors had gone home. It was the maintenance team who were there at 10.30 night helping us to set up that Ebola unit, and they would say to me, you're training all the doctors, why can't you train me in maintenance? And also, uh, there's some stuff I'd like to fix around here, but I need a soldering iron, and I, you know, some equipment I need. Yeah. But I said, look... You think if I go to DFID and ask them to help the maintenance department, they're going to be interested. That's not a good photo op. So in many ways, we have conditioned this. And across the hospital, you go into the HIV clinic. You know, they've got all this shiny equipment that the Americans have given them. But the Americans chose the equipment. You can't buy the spare parts in, in Sierra Leone. They weren't allowed to choose the equipment they wanted. The Americans pulled out of t two, after two years weren't to be seen from again. Uh, you know, and, and again, I used to have people come, can you try and get in Britain for me a spare part? We can't find <coughs> spare parts for this. Why were the donors not coming in and saying, what is the brand of uh, equipment we want to use here that we can get parts for available? But the donors are asked these questions, particularly these academic universities that go and do a research project in tropical medicine. It's hospital, they buy some microscopes. And so uh, in many ways, I would put the blame far more squarely on us um, on, on that one, actually. And I think we need to do much better in our practice. Thank you. I think if you look at the road system in the city, you'd have the same question about the English attitudes culturally to maintenance as well. Um, <laughs> can I ask two questions in ignorance? Um, one is you showed us that photo of the soldier and, and the quarantine area. What would be a more humane and intelligent way of containing a disease when you've got a very large number of people where either, presumably they're worried about the spread? And I, you know, the second thing is looking, think about that map. The third country was Guinea, which is francophone, which you haven't talked about. And I was just wondering whether the French did this any differently and how that situation played out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's hard to answer that question. We're very clear on, on what happened in Sierra Leone and Liberia. There was a, a much lower degree of transparency about what was going on in Guinea from the, from the very, very beginning. Um, and it, one of these, I mean, it, it, it's sort of interesting in that, I mean, you know, Guinea got, uh, got the crisis uh, first. And there was definitely, and you know, we, we, we sort of, we talked about this in the book vis-a-vis uh, -vis Guinea because it, it, it ends up having comp, uh, implications later for, for Sierra Leone. Initially in Guinea, there was quite a lot of um, denial and, and, you know, it, it, it does look as though WHO were somehow also complicit with the government in, in trying to, um, you know, sort of downplay what was going on because the government of Guinea were afraid to lose FDI mostly, and, and some of those were, were French uh, investors. And so, um, you know, there was, there was definitely downplaying of the numbers. There was, was non-publication of, of the data around Ebola. Um, and and we, did, we saw some of this as well in Sierra Leone at a later stage. Um, but one of the things that, that the British did when, when they came in was they said to the government, look, you know, you're not going to defeat this virus if you're cooking the numbers. I mean, this, this virus is all about transparency. It's all about knowing where cases are. If, you, if you're not open and public about where cases are, you're not going to be able to do anything. And so I, I think that was one important contribution that, that the British made. And the government of Sierra Leone basically were convinced and, and, and it was a much more open response. Uh, in Guinea, I mean, the French never took the same leadership role that the, uh, the Americans and, uh, and the British did in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, they, they did stuff, they definitely did stuff, um, but they didn't kind of come in in the same sort of very, very forceful way. Then again, as you can see in the graph, as far as we know, for some reasons, 
I think there's a few PhDs in this if anybody's interested. The, the epidemic in Guinea never reached the heights that, that, it, that it did in Sierra Leone and Liberia, and we don't know why. Um, you know, the, there's all you know there's all sorts of uh, you know people guessing, uh, but we really don't know why. But linking to your first uh, question, Sierra Leone was by far of the three countries the one that took the most punitive uh, approach. Even Guinea, which was a more military style government, uh, you know, I remember speaking to the head of the response in Guinea because they came to, you know, to sort of look and, and see if they could give us some tips and so on. And I remember speaking to him and, you know, he was like, c'est un peu militaire, n'est-ce pas? I mean, he was a little bit shocked at the court. And I was like, that's coming from you. This is, you know, he was a military guy. And I was like, okay, uh, this is a bit of a problem. So, um, so, so they, yeah, they, they, coming back to sort of what are better practices, so they had, um, they had something in Guinea which we started implementing towards the end where, and you're absolutely right, I mean you, an Ebola uh, uh, response requires isolation. I mean, you know, you can't just sort of, you know, say everybody and, you know, can just sort of roam around anywhere no matter what their Ebola status is. I mean, you know, you do, you do have to practice isolation. The critical issue is how you do it. And in Sierra Leone, it was very non it was, it was basically imprisonment. It was non-consensual. Um, and what did it do? It backfired, of course. I mean, you know, people, if, if, if somebody found out that somebody in their household had gone to the isolation unit, they wouldn't go home. They would, they would flee. You know, they would go stay somewhere else. They would, you know, they would, they would lie. They, they would say they're not part of that household. And so that obviously then increases infection ultimately because you know people people are are trying to avoid the response because they don't feel as though the response is a support to them they feel like the response is is what they need to avoid because you're you know if you're locked up for three weeks you can forget about your job i mean this is a country where you have really high rates of unemployment you don't show up for your job for three weeks there's 12 other guys who are going to come and take your job you know so we weren't we weren't thinking about these kinds of things but what we started to do towards the end was practice a more voluntary form of, of quarantine. And Yvonne, this, the woman who's now the mayor, she was one of the big proponents of this. So you would basically, you know, you would go to, to people who were at, at high risk, not everybody in, in a huge household, because, you know, you would actually, you know, try to really understand who was really at, at, at serious risk. And then you would go to them and you would say, look, we, if, we, if we put you, you know, staying in this, in this uh, center where we have, you know, facilities for you, we have a TV for you, you know, we have, you know, you'll have a mobile phone, we'll give you some credit, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, if you start to show symptoms, we will be able to help you right away and you will have a better chance of survival. And so it was that kind of approach. And people, by and large, <coughs> accepted voluntary quarantine. Uh, way more than people, uh, you know, th than the number of people who fled from the forced quarantine. So I think it really is about that, that, that issue of, of consent. I don't know, Oliver, if you... No, I mean, I would just say that it's incredibly difficult. When we started off at the Ebola unit at Connell, we said, uh, we'll, people will stay because we'll convince them it's in their best interest to stay, we'll provide them with good conditions and everything else, uh, and it didn't work. And part of the reason it didn't work is we were so short-staffed at the time that the, the conditions were bad in that Ebola unit, and we couldn't get the staff to do much about that. Uh, and you know, my colleague Marta, the Spanish infectious disease doctor, had this extraordinary kind of Gulliver's Travels day where a patient had escaped, and she had to track them down across the city with the police, and she had to climb up the side of this rock face to get to this community to interview the parents. And they eventually, the, the, the police took the parents hostage until the sun reappeared. And you know, other times I would come and I would find our patients dead on the pavement outside the hospital because they'd walked out in the night. Um, and, and, and at a time where every patient could spread. And in the end, we did lock the unit. We did not allow people to leave by force. And uh, uh, you know, so it's easy to say, uh, from a, you know, but that was different, I think, when you had infective, infected patients who you knew had been infected to family members in quarantine. So I just say that to say that it is uh, tricky. It's not, it's not an easy question, and it's about balance. But it was particularly that family quarantine issue that I think was, was most uh, mm -hmm. fault. Because and the vast majority of those people were not infected and were much more likely to become infected because they were locked up. Mm. You know? and this was, so we actually made the problem worse. Mm. Yeah. Two questions. Um, well, my name is Juliet Cheatham. The first is there was that and how it might change and.
and this is shows my absolute ignorance i was very struck by people need not have died because the impression given in the British press was this is fatal, this is the kiss of death, it's the bubonic plague, you know, you, few people might get it in Britain, you know, nurse and, you know, by massive intensive care they didn't die. So what, what is the actual basic treatment that prevents people from dying because it, we got a completely different story in Britain. Yeah, and I think I know. Yeah. yeah. No, so, I mean, to answer your question, I think it, what, what we were saying was less an individual patient, what would their survival rate have been, and more that most people should never have been infected. So it was more of the idea that if we'd had a good response early on, we could have, you know, the first few people who got infected around that village in Guinea, that their survival rates were very low, and that there's actually not a, not a lot. And we had to, uh, some colleagues at Harvard who pledged to massively reduce the mortality rate from Ebola. But the reality was they were never, despite throwing everything they had at it, they were actually never in Sierra Leone, Liberia, able to get really good survival rates from Ebola. Uh, it was more about it, it, the spread of the infection that, that didn't need to happen. That... Yeah, and, and now, I mean, it sort of relates to your question about WHO. Um, now there are five uh, uh, treatments being tried in, in, in Congo, um, which are, are um, you know, which is, which is a big step because, um, you know, it's, it's much more motivating to try and get people to come to a treatment center when, when there's actually a reasonable chance of, of survival. But coming back to WHO, WHO, yes, got a lot of criticism, deserved it, trust us, <laughs> you know, I mean, really, uh, yeah. Uh, you, you can read all about it in the book. Um, yeah, they, they, really, they really did mess up in those early days. They did improve during, during our outbreak, you know, really towards, um, you know, it certainly through 2015, you know, they, they did really play an important role, which is actually something, to be fair, that hasn't gotten very much press. I mean, they, they kind of got all the criticism and then... You know, in the middle of 2014, they definitely deserved it. They kind of, you know, sort, started sorting themselves out. By kind of January, we felt like, okay, this is actually a very good WHO response, and nobody was interested in covering that. So that is something that we, we try to give some, some time to in the book. But nevertheless, they had quite serious structural changes to make internally, um, and I think... Uh, I think they have made a lot of them. The WHO that we see now in Congo and the last couple of outbreaks in Congo, um, it's, it's much better, it's much more operational, it's much faster. Uh, of course, you'll have to see over time because, of course, they will tend to be uh, quite alert to Ebola outbreaks because they were absolutely, you know, as you know, uh, vilified uh, for, for, for that Ebola outbreak. So, of course, we would want to see this uh, continue with cholera and, you know, all the other, all the other health emergencies but, uh, and, and to see how that lasts over time. But they have a very good uh, health emergencies department now. They've got 600 people on the ground in, in North Kivu, 200 field epidemiologists. It's the operational WHO that we didn't see uh, in those early days. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's very welcome. They've, they have much stronger leadership on this. Uh, Dr. Ted Ross, their, 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 their director, I mean, he, he gets to these uh, Ebola outbreaks in Congo in about four days. Uh, we waited nine months to see Margaret Chan. We saw her for about two hours. Uh, so he is really personally kind of uh, uh, prioritizing this, um, you know, this, this response, which I think is is welcome. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's more uh, that they need to do, but I think everybody working, in the, the feedback we're getting from Congo is, you know, that they're, they're definitely operating much better. I do think one of the sort of still inherent tensions in the, the way that the response happening in DRC is, uh, yes, it's a health crisis, but by definition, uh, a health crisis like this is always also going to be a humanitarian crisis. And so it's to what extent WHO uh, should be leading everything and to what extent the traditional humanitarian system that comes in that focuses on displaced people and that focuses on protection of children and all these other things should take the lead. And I think uh, how does WHO maintain all this capacity when there might be a year when there isn't an outbreak? You know, how do you and how much is the international community going to continue to invest five years after the last big Ebola outbreak to maintain that capacity. So mm -hmm. I think there are some questions there, and, and we were with 
uh, Oxfam and other NGOs having this d debate the other day about you know, a health crisis and a humanitarian crisis, and this becomes a political issue within the UN about who's in charge and, yeah. and which system gets activated. And, um, it's, you know, it's more Sinead's area than mine. But. Yeah, and, and uh, they're having a particular problem at the moment because the, the, well, of the French-speaking the French -speaking staff in Congo. I mean, you cannot maintain 600 uh, technical people, in, you know, on the ground. You know, I mean, they, they've almost been there now for a year in, in Congo, and... You know, I was talking to the deputy head of the health emergencies department the other day, and he said, you know, we're really, really getting into problems now because a lot of these people have full-time jobs in, in Oxford or London or, or wherever else, you know. And, uh, you know, normally they say, oh, I'll, I'll do two weeks. Okay, maybe I'll do, you know, four weeks or something like that. But uh, especially with the French speakers, um, they're, they're struggling. But, again, that's not... So much a WHO, uh, it is a WHO problem, but, but it's more a sort of how, how the, the global health system is organized. And, uh... I think one switch that's happened that is exciting is so a lot of people from, who are involved in the response in Guinea, who are French speaking obviously, have, have gone over to support the response in DRC. And I think one of the things we probably look, need to look more at is why do we keep bringing people over from London and New York when actually there's now people with huge expertise in Africa mm -hmm. who could be redeployed. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the mistakes we made was Uganda had a lot of experience with big outbreaks. And in fact, a, a medical team from Uganda flew over to Monrovia and played a critical role in very rapidly opening a huge Ebola unit. They admitted huge numbers of Ebola patients from the community. And a lot of people say that was a turning point in Monrovia was the fact that so many patients suddenly had a bed to go to, and it's because the Ugandans knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly how to operate in those circumstances, were far more experienced than anyone from the UK. Um, but to what extent did we build that in? And one of my regrets is early on in the outbreak, I um, was put in touch with a guy called Francis Omazwa, who had been very senior in the Ministry of Health in Uganda at the time of their big outbreak and had been a kind of crisis coordinator. So he had, he had been in charge of the largest previous Ebola outbreak. And he gave me some amazing advice by email that I forwarded on to the Ministry of Sierra Leone, but why on earth didn't we put him on a plane? Yeah. Why on earth didn't we bring him out to help support the Sierra Leone government? So I think there's a lot more we could be doing, uh, and the African Union now is, is strengthening. There's now an African CDC that's been set up. Um, but I think it would be great to see uh, yeah, how, we could, how we could move more assets within the continent rather than always looking to the West, uh, who are not always the best place people to, to respond. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Andrew Lawson. Um, firstly, all credit to you for having done this book. I think it's a, a great contribution. And um, I should say I was in uh, Freetown in about November 2014, and a lot of what you say in terms of rec recommendations resonates with uh, things that Sierra Leoneans were saying at that time, mm. that it was about community, it was about accountability, these sorts of things. And I think it's also interesting that none of your recommendations are really technical. Mm. These are about governance, these are about management, and that kind of thing. Um, my question was, um, Sinead mentioned earlier that uh, Sierra Leone still has levels of infant and maternal mortality, which would be considered a crisis in, in any other country, uh, much higher than, I think, most of sub-Saharan Africa. And my question is whether there's anything that perhaps was learned from the response to the Ebola crisis that might be applied in, uh, in what should be a more normal circumstance, but which in, in many ways still is a crisis. Um, have the uh, different international agencies learned to work better together? Has the Ministry of Health uh, learned to work better with districts? Uh, is there any learning out of that that could be carried on into more operational functions? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think... <laughs> Margin, there's been marginal change. Like I th there's no doubt that it's still in people's minds, so there has been a renewed focus from the government and the health system. Uh, people recognize, you know, I think there's been a new, a new was it a World Bank estimate of the financial cost of the outbreak, which is over $50 billion now, the financial cost to the West African region because of the outbreak. Uh, schools closed for nearly a year, so I think people recognize that, that health is is integral part to part of the security of a country. And, you know... Um, so yes, and I think there's been some uh, you know, better cooperation. I think, though, that the kind of fundamental shift in approach uh, we haven't seen. And you know, Chanel often talks about the need for a generational investment in things like health and education. Um, and what we're seeing is a marginal investment. So uh, I, yeah, I think that you know, if there were another crisis, there was actually a mudslide, a very severe mudslide in Freetown, I think about 18 months after the end of the outbreak. And I think there was a much better response 
to that because people were still quite live. Some of those systems were still there. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not convinced. And in particular, you know, um, during the outbreak, DFID, initially we were really struggling for funding. Uh, and then they came along and they basically offered us a blank check. And my tiny team was, they said, it was quite a funny conversation. This fantastic humanitarian guy said, we want to give you t kings 10 million pounds. And my operating budget had been about 20,000 pounds a year. And I said, I don't, I don't want 10 million pounds. And he said, well, you have to have it. And I said, I want 100,000 pounds. And we had this negotiation. And we settled on a million. Um, but it was a very weird scenario. But one of the reasons I didn't want the funding is I said, I know the moment that the outbreak ends, the music will stop. And I will be left carrying this big outfit that we've built, and you won't fund it anymore. And they said, no, no, we're going to be with you for the long term. And the reality is that marginally more than before. But I, you know, as I think we need to challenge ourselves um, to pushing the British government and other international donors to making that generational investment in particularly, you know, yes, in the health system. But I think also if we want accountability, uh, we need education, and, and you're talking about this from an Irish perspective. Mm. You might want to talk more about that, but, but those kind of investments, what would you...? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think one thing that, that you know, in, in terms of the infant mortality, I mean, I don't know why infant mortality is so high in Sierra Leone. I mean, we were, we were the lead donor in nutrition, and, and about half of the infant deaths were linked to nutrition. We, we could see that in some way, usually not the primary cause anymore, but you know, one of the contributing causes. But uh, to me, I mean, you, you may know, Oliver, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I, 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 when I was in Sierra Leone, I did not think that we had a good understanding of why Sierra Leone rates of infant and maternal mortality were so disproportionately high. They're so much higher than Liberia, for example. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. And I think it comes back to, to this, you know, it comes back to these issues about community engagement. I mean, how much do we really understand, you know, when a lot of other things are similar, you know, between two countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia, that have a similar level of development, they have similar standard of healthcare and so on and so forth. You know, why is one so much higher than the other? And I think it, it's partly about this, you know, kind of maybe more anthropological uh, approach that we need to take to really kind of respect how significant differences in context can be, uh, and therefore then design our strategies accordingly. Whereas what we tend to do is, you know, a little bit cookie cutter. You know, we have this maternal health program in 25 countries, and this is a list of the countries, and you know, we do kind of reasonably similar things. Uh, and are we looking at in enough depth at what are some of the, um, you know, I'm not a, a doctor, I'm not a health expert, but I do, I do remember never being able to understand uh, why those rates are particularly high. And I think it, uh, um, and I, I think it, it, it does speak to, to our need to, to, to do different kinds of research and analysis and different kinds of planning. No, it's interesting, just on that point, one of which is I, I'm never that convinced about the data itself. You know, uh, where does this data come from? When I, when I look at the data that came out of our hospital, and our hospital's in the top hospital in the country, you know, the data that goes to ministry versus, you know, we just did a study recently of the declared death rates in the hospital and the actual bodies that went to the morgue every day outside our window, and they wouldn't quite, you know, and if you can't count deaths in your main hospital accurately, then what hope is there in a rural area? So I, I don't know um, how much of this is just the fact that our data is very poor. Um, but the other thing I'd say is just I think the most, Im I was reflecting, I think the most important thing that's happened from Ebola was actually the fact that the government uh, lost the last election. Uh, to everyone's surprise, I don't think, I didn't expect that to happen. I thought that the power of incumbency would mean that the, the, the former government would carry on. Uh, they didn't, and there was a peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and I think that might hopefully lead to a greater sense of accountability. Hopefully the government, current government realizes that might happen to them. You know, so it, what we might be seeing, and I think across the ECOWAS region, there's a certain amount more regional pressure from other countries to be, uh, you know, uh, be accountable in Gambia, for example. There was a, you know. mm. So I'm kind of hoping that, if anything, it's that, that accountability might, might be the biggest change. Is it great? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested in how you um, t transfer this learning 
and I've done some work on the idea of transferring learning using simple rules. And it's, for, for instance, in your case, one of your simple rules would seem to be make the best of what you have rather than bring in an entire hospital that takes months and months to, 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 to bring in. So it might be better if, in that case, if uh, aid agencies and governments brought in expertise on, on lateral thinking rather than, than lots of equipment. I'm just wondering if it put you on the spot. What, what would your simple rules be if you were faced with another international incident of this sort of proportions that you had to respond to? I think that's directed at you, Oliver, as far as I can see. <laughs> um, I, there are a few. So I think one is um, to get informed about the context. I wasn't informed enough. Sine I learned a lot about Sierra Leone's history from Sinead's opening chapter on Sierra Leone's history. Um, <laughs> which is a disgrace. Which is a disgrace, you know. Um, <laughs> But, but um, yeah, so get informed and, and, and particularly listening. The discipline of when I, you know, going into a room or a community uh, and, and me just shutting up and listening for a while. Um, and, you know, especially as a doctor and a white man, I sort of used to doing a lot of the talking and actually learning to shut up a lot more. Uh, I say as I sit here in the front of a room talking, but, um, <laughs> but I think so part of it would be listening. Uh, and as you say, um, you know, working, mapping out what you've got uh, and how to use that, you know, effectively going forwards. I think another thing would be, um, for every, you know, so often we sat in meetings and we came up with policies that made technical sense but made no human sense. And Shadeo often points, this was not really, this was a social, uh, the Ebola outbreak was kind of a social problem and a social phenomenon rather than a medical one more than anything else. So we would sit there and as Sinead said, we would produce rules by, about things like saying, if your loved one is sick, don't touch them. And we would think that's a sensible thing from a medical perspective to do, but we kept on not doing that empathy piece of saying, let me for a moment pause this meeting, put myself in the shoes of someone on the receiving end of that whose two-year-old baby is, is crying and sick and crying for help. You know, is that something I would really do? So the discipline, as a simple rule, of every policy decision, pausing for a moment as an exercise to say, How would, what would I do if this were me or my child? I think if we'd been doing that at the time, we'd have had a much better response. So those are a couple. Any other I mean, just, words just, of wisdom? Just, just one additional one, I think. I mean, I'm in the kind of interesting position now where, you know, South Sudan borders on Congo and the part of Congo that's having this uh, crisis. So we are go undergoing an Ebola preparedness um, uh, <coughs> process in case, in case we get it. And I think... I think anybody who knows South Sudan knows that if South Sudan gets Ebola, it's, it's game over. I mean, it's going to make the Sierra Leone health system look like the Finnish health system if South Sudan gets Ebola. So um, w one of the things, so, so I'm, I'm in this situation now where I have kind of another chance to, do, uh, to, to work on preparedness. And so I, I suppose I've, I've had a chance to think about um, how to operate differently than I did the last time. Um, and for me, you know, I mean, this might uh, sound a bit surprising for Oliver because I had a very, I, my reputation in, in Sierra Leone, as I've been told, is very much about um, harassment. You know, my, my role was very much around harassment and, and sort of, you know, I had a, a sort of a list of, of things. Because coordination was so terrible for so much of the response, I sort of took this on myself uh, uh, um, in, in retrospect and I sort of used to have this bedraggled kind of A4 sheet of paper with all the things that, you know, and, you know, WFP and, you know, can, can they, you know, you know, talk to so-and-so about, you know, getting the PPEs to Kenema and all this, you know, people would ring me and I would say, oh, put it on my list and I would try and harass whoever was responsible for that. It's not the way to, to run a response, by the way. But uh, I would do even more harassment and, 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 and in, in South Sudan at the moment, uh, I guess because, because of what I've seen, uh, and, you know, be, you know, because I've seen, you know, how terrible this can get, I think I'm even less concerned now about what people think and how annoying it is. Um, and it's really annoying. Like, I know for, for my friends in WHO who are trying to concert on Congo, I know it's really annoying that I keep sending them WhatsApp messages about South Sudan and, you know, what they need to be doing and can they come. And, you know, I know it's, and I sort of like, sorry, this is really annoying. And I always write this as well, you know, and I realize you're supposed to be focusing on Congo. But I think, uh, um, I think, you know, people like me have a responsibility to, you know, to, to really push these issues and not just kind of get on well with everyone and worry too much about, you know, our relationships and not being annoying because, 
um, you know, sometimes you need you need kind of uh, people to be kind of disruptive and annoying. So that's that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. And I a list of people who will testify how annoying it is, but I think I think it, it has to be done. Hi, um, Julia Beer from Primary Care International. Um, um, it's a question about lessons learned as well. Um, my organisation does a lot of work actually on non-communicable diseases in Africa. Um, and I felt like a lot of the um, recommendations in the book apply to all aspects of, of health. Um, and I wondered in your conversations, your many experiences in Sierra Leone, what arguments, if any, did you find to be the most compelling arguments for investing in primary healthcare systems to have a better base preparedness for things like this? Well, there's Raj Punjabi's, uh, uh, so, so Raj Punjabi's actually, I think he, he's an American physician, was born in Liberia and, and sort of been working at uh, Harvard and all sorts of places in Boston and, and went back to, to Liberia to work on the response. And he, he did a Senate hearing of some kind for some reason. And, and he said, uh, I know I won't get this, this exactly right, but it was something like, you know, um, the thing you really need, uh, you know, in a serious health crisis is a functioning day-to-day -day primary health care system. And I think, you know, we all sort of clapped uh, when we saw this on, on YouTube. And I think it is this, uh, you know, it is this notion, I think Oliver was referring to this earlier, that, you know, everybody wants to kind of work on the sexier stuff and, you know, emergencies and, and, and you know, and, and all of that. And, and I had the the experience of, uh, um, I spent five years uh, chairing the, the Health Sector Pool Fund in Liberia, which was kind of the main activity that we did in Liberia when, when I was based in Sierra Leone. And it was a hellish job. Uh, it was a hellish job because it was all about those, it was all about things like the national, you know, the, the national drug system that you know, we just, just did not function properly and had all this leakage and like, you know, it was just all this really, really detailed work around that and around, you know, human resources for health and salaries and incentives and, you know, and it was, it was really, um, it was really, really difficult work. It was highly political, but at the same time, I think it's one of the best things I've ever been involved in. And I'm not saying it worked so great or anything like that, but it did some, some things in terms of sort of transferring how, Liberian health, primary health was being, uh, um, you know, because after the war in Liberia, it was international NGOs running things, and slowly, slowly through the pool fund, we, we transferred that back to the government uh, system. But it's really hard work, and it, lots of people don't want to do it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just don't see how, how are you ever going to, you know, how are you, you know, whatever about pre preventing crises. I mean, so many. Uh, of the diseases that uh, you know that we struggle with could actually be handled by the by the primary system. But anyway, this is your area. Oliver. No, I mean I think you spoke really well, and I think um, you can. There's no way of really getting around the need for a primary healthcare system in a crisis, and you can't reinvent it. You you know because it needs to be in every community, in every village, and you know so there's no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to that, and that's what we found out to our expense. And you know, kind of ridiculous efforts were made uh, to get around that, but. Um, not only was it impossible and expensive to try and build things outside of communities, but it, it also speaks to that first point. If we know that trust and really engagement with communities is the most important thing, then who else can do that but the primary healthcare system? And so, yeah, um, we're certainly sold. We just want to try and get DFID and others to be as sold as we are. We've got one more question. Thanks. Hi, Kate Seal. I'm in awe of your story. It's absolutely staggering. You didn't sign up for any of that. I want to know on a personal level how you felt. Were you ever so frightened you wanted to run away from this crisis? Did you ever feel um, threatened? How did you keep yourself safe? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I, didn't, I never wanted to run away. In fact, my problem was the opposite. Uh, Kings, for quite understandable reasons, wanted us to evacuate. Um, they, they, you know, the insurance liabilities alone were quite significant. Uh, for a long time, the British Embassy said, we will not evacuate you if you get sick. If you get sick, you're staying here for the best available care in the country. Which, and I knew perfectly well that was because it was in my own hospital and it was nothing. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, so my problem was actually desperately trying to convince them every single day uh, not, to, not to evacuate us because 
you know, for me, it was a different experience. And in many ways, I'm, I'm more impressed by the people who chose to run into the burning building. I was already in the building when it caught fire or whatever. You know, this was my hospital. These were my colleagues. This was my community. Where was I going to go? It was a slightly different experience for me. But yes, you know, there, 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 there was no vaccine at that time. There's no uh, getting around the fact that, um, you know, uh, you work these long shifts. And every day, every day something happens that you think might, might put you at risk. You know, you're in a meeting with a doctor sitting next to each other and that doctor that night tests positive for Ebola and the next day a patient is collapsed and you don't have your PPE on, but they, what are you going to do? And, and then that night you start to feel, you know, it's a hot country and you're exhausted and you start to feel like you might have a fever and you immediately think, that maybe this is it, maybe, uh, maybe I'm infected, I don't know. Uh, and and there's this you know you're living this 21 day clock because 21 days is the incubation period. So 21 days after something happens, you're thinking I might any day I might get sick, and, and inevitably on the 21st day, just when you're nearing the end, something else happens and you start the clock again. And we were all on this cycle. And you know my colleagues who were there, we had a thermometer in the office, and, and we didn't want to admit to each other or really to ourselves about this. So we, you'd see someone kind of sneaking the thermometer out to the bathroom to check each other's temperatures because we didn't want to be honest with each other the risks that we faced. And you know. Uh, and some of my colleagues, you know, did test positive, not within King's, but within other organizations. And, you know, there were moments around the Ebola response. Also, for us in the early days, there was a lot of um, rioting outside the hospitals. There was a real belief that this was a conspiracy. Uh, and therefore, you've taken, you've taken my loved one away to kill them in that tent. And that was quite a rational thing to believe. Take their organs and send them to Europe, and you'll take their blood, and yeah. You know, and I, you know, I heard about a story in, in the, uh, under the kind of previous authoritarian rule in Sierra Leone about how the president had organised for a doctor at the hospital to kill one of his cabinet ministers by poisoning them under the guise of, and it was a widely conceived urban myth. I don't know if it, if it was true or not, but people believed, you know, in a country like you know with with the, with the governance problems, and so. You know, none of these things were completely crazy, but it meant that there was sometimes real violence at our gates, and, and we only had one entry and exit point of the, of the unit. You know, what if the ho someone set fire to the hospital and we were trapped? What if we were attacked? And, you know, so there were a lot of ways in which it was frightening. Um, but I come down, well, I'll say two things. One of which is um, there was no question this is where, you know, I think my whole team felt we were supposed to, supposed to be, and, and uh, none of us. You know, I, I wrote in the book that I, I was worried sometimes that, I and my colleague Marta created a lot of peer pressure on my colleagues not to leave because we said there's no way we're leaving. So it's quite difficult for my colleagues to say, actually, you know, we want to evacuate. And I worried that we put pressure on them. They came up to me after and said, no, we really, we really didn't. But the other thing I would say is that um, however hard it was for me, it was 100 times harder for my Sierra Leonean colleagues. I'll show you one photo. Uh, these two guys here were nursing students. Uh, they volunteered to work in the un unit as students because we couldn't get nurses to work there. Uh, and I didn't know this at the time, but a few weeks into working there, they came home and their family said, you can't work there anymore if you want to come back to this house because we're afraid you'll get sick. We'll all get quarantined with you. We'll get sick. I can't put my other children at risk like that, so you have to quit the unit. And they said, no, I, I've got a commitment to my colleagues and to my patients and to this country, and so I'm going to stay. And so they, they didn't see their families for months, and they ended up living in a storeroom in the hospital and... This guy in the blue t-shirt cut his finger on a vial in the unit, and he didn't want to tell anyone. He kept it a secret, and he became sick. But, but because he and his colleague next to him were sharing the same mattress in the storeroom of the hospital because they'd been kicked out of their houses, uh, he became sick as well at the same time. And, and this is actually the celebration when they survived and came back to the hospital. And the day they survived, they said, look, we're, we're back on duty because you know, you know you need our help. And at Kerrytown, they survived. They survived at Kerrytown, the British <laughs> Army. You know, as much as I criticize the slowness, the quality of care was superb. The British Army kept these two guys alive. Uh, the guy behind would get sick the day later. He, was on, he got sick on, I think, the 21st day of his incubation period. Um, and for, for these guys, there was no medivac. There was no special care. No health insurance. No health insurance. No life insurance. So, you know, how, whatever it was like, for me, it was times 100, times 1,000 for these guys. And so I guess I'd, I'd kind of say that. And I don't know if you'd add any. Yeah, no, I mean, I would just agree. I think... Um, I think it was a privilege, it might sound like a strange thing to say, but I think like, like Oliver, I felt like I was in the right place at the right time because, especially in those early months, there was this exodus. I mean, a lot of our, our friends uh, um, you know, left and were, were ordered to leave by their organizations. And so it was very much a sort of keeping head down policy uh, and, and absolutely lying to one's parents um, and, and maybe... <laughs> Maybe understating. Is this being recorded? <laughs> Maybe understating things to one's organizations, and it was. We we did. I mean, we, I also had to. 
you know, have a lot of very, very long uh, um, conversations with, with my government about staying because, um, you know, I mean, there was obviously people were reading all sorts of things in, in the Irish Times and then we would get a call and, and, and uh, you know, actually one of our, our minister, our minister for defense went into the Irish Times and somebody said, well, will Irish soldiers go and work on a bowl? And he said, no, it's far too dangerous. And I was like, oh, no. Um, and actually they did. You know, actually, funnily, six weeks later, they came and they helped us. They worked out of the embassy and we, 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 we got Irish soldiers to help with building treatment centers and things like that. But anyway, he said that and that, that was, you know. So, so we had this sort of constant battle. Um, and I think we, we both felt like we were pretty lucky uh, that we eventually uh, kind of won that battle for long enough with our organizations that we got over the worst of it and they allowed us to stay because it would have been devastating to leave because the more people who left the more necessary everybody was who stayed and and for our national staff you know at the embassy I mean if we'd left I mean they would have just felt so abandoned I mean people left during the civil war you know people have a lot of memories also of evacuations during the civil war and you know internationals you know they're with us one day and the next day so um, so we were all, and again, you know, part of it is luck. You know, you could easily have staff members within your own team who who really want to leave and so on, and 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 that can be very uncomfortable. I was also just very lucky that my team, you know, that everybody just wanted to stay and and uh, and work and and make some kind of a contribution. And I really do feel like it was it was a privilege to be there. Um, well, I think let's uh, bring that to a close. If if you'd. Um uh, thank with me, uh, Sinead and Oliver, for sharing their, their story with us, uh, writing this book, which I'm informed you can buy it for £10 outside, um, and uh, for also kind of making the, the boring stuff, uh, quote end quote, of emergency response uh, just so fascinating. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Ollie and Sinead. Cheers.